Okay, so the stream even here is um, giving me problems, so I'm not sure exactly where the problems are coming from, so I'm just going to record it, and then I'll post it. So we'll do it that way so I don't have to worry with the uh, flaky internet issues, um, and then I'll investigate why they might be doing that. So I spent a few minutes talking about our new filament here that we uh, just printed, uh, and it was a new one that I hadn't printed before. So um, I'll do that again, and then we'll move on to what we're talking about today. Today we're going to look at this Delta printer back here. Um, so what we've got is, um, well, two. This one is sort of ordinary, but it is a carbon fiber PETG black um, filament, and it basically has um, tiny bits of carbon fiber chopped in it, and you get a nice, nice print. The focusing on this particular camera is kind of crazy. I'm not sure how it decides to focus, but um, it came out really nice and it's a strong print. Um, I was weighing it because the other one, here we go, it's uh, you know your 10 grams that we've been getting as the average for most of these other prints. The other one though is, you know, it looks all the same, but it's this stuff. It's eSun. Um, EPLA LW, so the LW is lightweight. This is, um, it's not a low density, but it is a foaming. So it actually ends up low density after you print it. Um, right now, like the, the actual filament feels like normal filament. Um, you, you might could tell that it's a little bit different texture, but uh, it's basically the same filament um, feel to it. But when you print it, it expands, it foams up. Um, and expands. Now you don't really get a bad surface finish or anything that you can kind of see there. It actually did focus on it a little bit there um, for a moment. Well, now I can't make it do it again. But So you can see the layer lines. Let's see if we can look at the layer lines on that PTG. You know, they're about the same. It just is focusing maybe the sense. Let's move it a little bit there. There we go. Well, you don't get these, like I thought you would get uncontrollable foaming that it looked really badly, but it doesn't. That's my, that's my point is that it doesn't look horrible. Now it does have one little spot over here, but I caused that one when I, I was actually messing with it while it was printing and I caused that one. This one here at the top, that little burnt looking spot, um, that is where it finished printing and this stuff does foam a whole lot. And um, basically there was this little blob of ooze when it finished printing and I had to cut that off a bit. Um, it like was coating on the on the nozzle. So I would I would definitely change up um, the end routine on the um, like your end G code so that it, as soon as it finished the last line of G code it immediately picked up um, and that one didn't it kind of stayed there and then moved to the side and it blobbed on it. So um, it probably does not work very well with retraction. Um, because of the, the amount of ooze, the foaming, uh, that uh, you probably would have to be very aggressive on retraction to deal with that. Now, what you're normally doing with the, the lightweight stuff is you're trying to print something obviously lightweight. A lot of times you're in base mode, so you're only printing one wall, so you don't need retraction. And um, you're probably not going to have to worry with it. If you were trying to do something that needed retraction, then it would probably be very stringy. It would, it would print, but it would be very stringy, I imagine. Um, to get this stuff to print, well, let's, let's look at this stuff here. Here it is. So this is um, a little bit more expensive. Apparently you can, oh, that's if you want to subscribe to it. Uh, so you probably don't want to subscribe to this stuff. Um, so it is twice-ish the cost of um, what the regular PLA type stuff is. It prints like PLA, but I will say that in order to get the maximum amount of foaming, you probably have to print it uh, at a temperature that's not good for a stock Ender 3 because I printed this stuff at um, 250. So here's Cura. I have this pulled up um, because that's another variable you need to change. But um, the, the two things, let's see, yes, the two things I changed are printing temperature. So I printed it at 250 where I had been printing at, you know, 200 or whatever for P 
PLA 205. Um, this is a PLA, but and it will print at those lower temperatures. But um, its print range, I don't know if you noticed it on the little label over well over here. The the print range is actually 190 to 270. So closer to the low end, 190, 200, it doesn't foam much or maybe any. Uh, but at the hotter end, then it will foam about double its size. So um, that's how you get the lightweight part of it is you can take up the same amount of volume with half the material, more or less. And if we weigh this, um, did I weigh it? I think I weighed it already. It's like four and a half or five grams. And uh, so that's about half of what the typical PLA print is going to weigh for this vase shape. Um, the other thing that you have to change is what's shown on the screen right here, this outer wall flow. Um, you need to change that down to 50% so that when it's doing, and then again, that's for spiralized outer contours so that you're really only printing outer walls other than the bottom of the print. Um, and you drop that down to 50% so that when it um, expands, it takes up the other 50%. Uh, and so there, there probably is a little tweaking necessary. I did not have to tweak anything other than the temperature that outer wall flow thing, so I did have to re-slice it because you can't modify that outer wall flow um, on just the screen. You might be able to take a regular profile and drop the flow to 50% on everything and it worked out. I didn't try that, I just re-sliced it with the outer wall being 50%. Um, there, it, there was one little issue since the bottom is not an outer wall, it was not trying to flow at 50% and it was flowing way too much. So um, I did have to bump up the Z height on the bottom during the print to get it to not, um, to get it to be able to print because it was too close to the bed and there was no room for all this material foaming up to go. So um, I did have to raise the Z offset. So you could probably just change your flow rate here, you know, for everything down to 50%. I was only doing a base mode, and so I only changed the outer wall flow. That did affect the bottom a little bit, though. I had to had to watch that. Um, other than that, it printed fine. Um, it is certainly does what it says it does. It is weaker, you know. You can imagine it's a little bit weaker, but it's not like it's weak. Um, it still has plenty of structural strength. Um, not as much as you know. This this thing is carbon fiber infused PETG. So it's, it's actually a much stronger part. Um, but if you're going for lightweight, you know, something in the RC realm, or, or just for some reason you need a lightweight part, then it's, it definitely does that. And it doesn't, I, my fear was that it, the side walls were going to be all lumpy and everything. And they might be a little bit lumpier than the other things I've been printing, but it's not as significant as I thought it was going to be. So if you're looking for something lightweight, particularly in the RC uh, area, you know, RC cars or planes or rockets or something like that, and then it is a good material for that. That's, I've seen several sites that I couldn't name them offhand right now, but I've seen several sites where you can download STLs of um, like an uh, RC plane that pr the parts print in base mode, internal structures and everything is really neat. Um, and they use the lightweight PLA to save on weight. So that's that's those two things. The other things I wanted to talk about today were this printer in the background here. This is a little uh, different style of printer that we haven't looked at before. And since I was here, I thought, oh, well, I'll just get this guy off the shelf. Um, so this is an up mini, but that's not the important part. The important, it's got um, several parts on it that don't come on the up mini, but the idea here is that um, it is a Delta style printer. So kind of noisy. Again, this is a cheaper version. I got this on Amazon Prime a year or two ago, maybe two years ago. Um, and, but uh, it is a Delta printer where we've been using Cartesian printers. So you get a couple of advantages for Delta printers. Generally, they can print faster. They have less mass that they have to move around uh, so that they can move that mass faster. Uh, they don't um, 
the you know the the delta means that there are three you know three connection points here. I can't find the other one. There it is. Um, to move it in your x y z directions. So that um, is a little bit of a downside because if any of these are out of you know out of tune, out of spec, they're the wrong length. This this one is a little bit longer than these others or whatever. Then all of your prints are going to be a little bit distorted. Um, another problem can be that it's really hard to, now that you notice this one's really small, like this is about the smallest delta print, smallest printer of any kind that you can get that's FDM style. Um, but uh, the downside is going to be that it's also going to be more difficult to create a flat plane out of these this kind of movement with the three uh, different uh, end of vectors. So it, it has some downsides. It's generally used if you want to print something um, tall. So it, they generally have a tall and narrow type of part. The bed does not move, so you're going to be able to get, um, not have to worry about ringing or anything. You, you do have to worry about maybe this guy ringing. Um, so that's why I've got these rubber bands here and here is they're kind of keeping a little bit of extra pressure on these rods so that they don't have slop in them. Um, I'll turn it on. It's it's another one of these that has a really loud fan, so we may not can do much with it on because it's so loud. Let me find the on button. Oh, <laughs> it doesn't have an on-off switch, so it plugs in. Um, I've added a little on-off switch, just a plug that you can turn on and off, basically, um, because it doesn't have an on button anywhere. It has some buttons over here. This is not a touch screen. Um, it's just uh, a screen that gives you a couple of bits of, bits of information. There's no filament in it. Uh, apparently there's some, you know, kind of left here. I don't know if I even want to load up any or not, but um, we'll, we'll look at it and kind of see what it'll do uh, as far as seeing some of its motion. And again, this is probably not the one you would want to get. Let me, let me show you some of the ones that are better over here. Um, these, these are the better, but still affordable Delta printers and much larger. These are, uh, much larger printers than what we're looking at on my desk here, but you're looking in the, here's one that's not, there's an entry level one, 200 by 200 millimeter print size. Um, so that's a little smaller print size than your Ender 3. Um, the the uh, printer is way taller though, but you, you have these, you know, the, the rods are going to take up a bunch of space where you can't print the entire height of the printer. Um, these FL Suns are probably the ones I would start with if I wanted to add a Delta printer to my collection. Maybe this was the one that I would go with, but here's, this one doesn't look bad. It's a little bit cheaper. You can save $20 also. Um, you know, it, they, they are faster printers typically because you don't have as much mass to move around. You don't have to worry about the uh, bed moving back and forth and that being your limiting factor. So they are faster. Um, they're a little bit finicky on the tuning and your parts. Um, it takes a little bit of tuning to get your parts, uh, in shape so that they're the actual dimensions you expect them to be They're They're close right off the bat, but um, they may not be as accurate as something you print on a Cartesian printer. Um, let's see, there's a SD card in here, so maybe I can start something. Uh, let's see, we will, we will print, and let's see, I've got, um, there's a flow test. Now there's no there's no filament in here anyway, so I'll have to round some up if I actually want to print. But I really just kind of want it to go through its startup routine so you can kind of see how it moves. Um, but it again, it like I said, it's got a really loud fan on this particular one. And uh, it's going to be hard to hear anything over its fan noise, I think. Let's see. Currently it's heating. It does have a heated bed. I have added, this is a little magnetic bed on it. Um, Oh, let me show you these since I'm thinking about it, and I'll 
I don't know, maybe I'll grab some filament. I probably won't be able to load filament in time. Trying to find something that's PLA like ethyl polycarbonate. Well, I guess I have, oh, well, that, I have that carbon fiber. This does not, I don't know what kind of nozzle it has in it. I don't even know the diameter nozzle that it has in it anymore. Um, I assume it's a 0.4, probably brass. So I probably don't want to run the carbon fiber through it. Um, but what I was going to show you are these little things. These are really good for, um, you know, cleaning off your print surfaces. If you don't want to deal with like a spray bottle and isopropyl alcohol, these things will work um, and you just throw them away when you're done. All right. Let's see, there's some filament. some yellow filament. Uh, let's see, we need a... See if we can, I assume this, uh, the file that's on here says flow test, so I assume that's going to be like just a box with walls to test the, um, uh, how well the uh, line width matches whatever the nozzle diameter is supposed to be. So let's see if I can actually get the nozzle. Yeah, you know, I'm going to cancel the print job. And we're going to load, I'm going to try to load some filament. So let's uh, preheat the nozzle to 205. And see if we can load some filament and maybe make it print something. The good thing about this being recorded, I guess, is I could fast forward this part if I wanted to. Um, it uh, that I do remember this on here. They are sort of underpowered, so they just have. Let me see if I can show it. They just have a little PC brick, and it's a small one at that uh, power supply. So. Um, it does take them a while to heat their bed and their nozzle. Uh, I do remember that being a little bit of an issue. Now, the bed is really tiny, but it still takes a while to heat it up to any reasonable temperature. So these are probably only going to print PLA. You might get them to print PTG. I don't know. I don't know that I ever tried. Um, on this, not, in, not Delta printers in general, this particular up mini, um, which I don't even know if they s still make the things. Let's see. Is it not up? Maybe it's Mono Price Mini. Maybe that's the name of it. Hmm, I don't. Yeah, I don't see them on Amazon anymore. I don't even remember the actual name. I think it might be Mono Price Mini. I think that's what the little thing up here said. All right, I can smell that it's heated up enough that we can try to load some filament. This little roll. The, the drive for it is way up here at the top. So it is about to drive way up here. And then you can see this tubing going down here. And I do remember it being kind of finicky to load.
let's see if we can just two out of here. Well, we may not be able to easily load anything today. It's kind of okay. I mean, go down enough to kind of get there. I'll give it another shot. You know, it, it could be clogged too, I don't know. Um, well, I'm gonna say let's let's just let it go through its uh, print routine just to so you can see how it moves. Oh no! It's Having a hard time reading the SD card. Well, let's well. I don't know that it's going to do that. I don't even know. I guess I can just manually move it. Let's let it do its home. Let's see if it'll do that. And shut it off, turn it off, and back on. There we go. There's its homing routine. So it actually homes at the top. The limit switches are at the top for each of these uh, areas. So that's it homing. So you can kind of see that. Um, I don't think there's any other controls that I can actually do, though as far as on this printer um let's let it try you know i think it's going to print the uh flow test there's no filament i, I gave up on loading the filament i don't want to i probably need to take it apart and see if there's a uh, clog in there um i don't remember i haven't used like i said i haven't used it in quite a while there was it's an interesting little printer, but um, I don't know. It just didn't uh, didn't do a whole lot. <laughs> so I have other printers that can do more. Um, it's mainly interesting because it's the Delta style printer. We'll kind of let it do its thing over there, and um, it does um, use a uh, the bed. I don't know if you can see over here. So the bed. See that light coming on? The bed actually has uh, switches under it so that the nozzle will come down and probe the bed to get a bed mesh. So that's that's kind of interesting. It's very sensitive though. So you have to have these um, to where just almost no touching will set them off. Just a very lightweight touch. Um, that's kind of what these printed. Uh, well, these are part of that, but these are also keeping stuff from dropping down in there, kind of like the fan guard that we printed on the Ender 3. Um, but I did go in and change up how this thing is spring-loaded so that uh, it doesn't take a lot of contact for it to trigger the switches on it. Um, it's trying to heat up the bed right now. It actually got the bed heated up. 
Well, sometimes it does, and then it drops back down. <clears throat> In the meantime, let's look at this. So, let me set this guy over here. This came in the other day. This is the hermit crab from BQ, I think. Yeah, there we are. And what it does, if I can get it open, is it lets you change out, um, I, I would say nozzles, but actually anything on your printer. So, nozzles would be one of the things it would let you change out. So, this is it here. And, um, this is actually two parts. So you've got this part that mounts on your rails. And so you can kind of see a couple of different mounting options here. Um, I would mount it. There's other parts in here too. Here are two more of these pieces. So you've got three of these things. And then you've got a couple of... Uh, pieces of hardware, uh, what else is there, what's this guy in here? All these boxes are full of different ways to mount and I haven't gone through all of them to see what's in the variety. Here's one bracket. So this bracket actually would work with the uh, Ender 3. Looks like it would. It's got the three spots for the wheels and then you could mount this guy to it. Actually, I think it's likely that way. Oh. Came alive, so it's uh, it's trying to load filament right now. It just doesn't have any, um, so it's a, probably about to do its uh, probe. So there, it did a home routine, and then we're gonna do. There's it's doing the mesh leveling right now. So you can kind of see now some of the newer and better printers, uh, Delta style printers do this same thing, but much, much faster. Like it's, it's actually uh, interesting to watch how fast they do the bed probe. But you can hear this one's, you know, it's rattly, it's loud. Uh, the definitely does not have silent stepper drivers. but it's probing all the way across the little bed here. And what it's doing is it's pushing down on the bed with the nozzle um, and then triggering the little switches that are under it. And then it would go into printing, although it has no filament. So, um, oh, it's there, there it would start as printing. So you, it thinks it's printing something right now, but it's not doing anything. But that's kind of the motion that you get. And this, again, this is a slower. I don't, it doesn't tell me what speed it's printing at. But this is definitely not um, a fast speed for it or any of the Delta printers. But you kind of get an idea of what they do and how they go about operating. Um, maybe I do need to get one of those uh, nicer ones that are a little more modern. This guy usually just sits on the shelf. So I'm going to shut it down. Just because it's not doing anything, you get the idea of how they work, um, and uh, I, it's noisy. There we go. All right, back to our back to our deal here. Now let's see what's up in these boxes. I assume these are just going to. Oh no, here's a, a wire loom. So the the thing about these is. That it's not just that you can snap on a different uh, nozzle or whatever, but uh, let's see what's in this this one. But that you they're wired up. Um, oh, these are tools and things like that. So here's your base plate that's going to stay on the printer, and um, you wire in uh, whatever you think is going to be necessary to control the uh, attachments. That you're going to put on there so like you're going to have to have your uh, thermistor you're going to have to have your heater uh, you might have a bl touch or you might put a laser on there and do some laser engraving or you might put a little little cnc meal tiny meal uh, bit like a very tiny dremel 
um, and it needs power and speed control. Um, oh, your fan. So you connect all these connections to the base plate, and then they have these pogo sticks here where each one of the accessory plates um, has a matching set of connections on it. And so if this one was going to be my, uh, maybe this is going to be my direct drive uh, mosquito hot end. And so I, I mount the hot end on here and it's, and I wire in the um, fan, the, well, both fans, the park cooling fan and the um, hot end cooling fan. I wire in the heater and I wire in the thermistor and maybe I have a BL touch that's also on this. I wire that in to this plate. So it's all one unit. And then in order to install it, I just go, this is mounted to the printer and they, I've got to get it the right way, <laughs> they snap in. And now, now it's a um, mosquito direct drive setup. Um, but maybe then I want to mount a, a little, you know, couple of watt laser to do some laser engraving. I push this down. Oops, where are we at? Push this down. That one pops off, and I get the plate that's got the uh, laser mounted. And so I would mount the laser to this guy, wire in the laser to these, and you know, now I'm laser engraving. And so it comes with uh, three of these uh, accessory plates. You can get more, but it comes, the little kit comes with three. Um, I, there is a pro, uh, I don't remember, no, it's a can version of this um, that adds some wireless uh, Raspberry Pi type functionality to it. I don't think, it, I, I didn't come up with an idea of what I would do with that right off the bat, so I didn't get that one. Um, they're not super cheap. Let me see if I can find the price. I think it's 150 something like that. Um, let's look at that. Hermit Crab from BQ. Yeah, here it is. So $150, well, say $15 with the coupon. Um, so, you know, it it is... I don't know if, what point it justifies it. Um, I would think it justifies it when you have a real reason to have only one printer or one, like one, you're limited on space maybe. And so you've got space for one machine, but you want to do multiple things with that machine um, day to day. So I think at that point, you know, that would be kind of the reason. Otherwise, it's just kind of a cool thing that you probably aren't ever actually going to do. Uh, you know, you're never going to change out the nozzle or whatever. So it would, you'd have to figure out why you were getting one of these because they're not super cheap. They are well made though. These are aluminum plates. Uh, here we go. These are aluminum plates. The connections look good. Now I have not mounted it yet and actually tried it, but it looks good. Um, the connection here, it's this spring loaded. You can kind of see the little guillotine looking latch there. Oh, almost dropped it. Um, and then you've got a pretty uh, substantial hook on this piece and the connection there's no there's no slop in it or anything like that so um, it's not going to be a very wobbly connection I did a couple of years ago I don't know if I can find this one fast enough but uh, let me see if I can find it I did print a similar thing without the electrical connections um, If I can find it, I don't. I might have to just add it later because I'm not sure I can find the one I printed. It was on Thingiverse at the time, um, but I don't know if I could easily find it. There's another one of these same type of things called the X change, like exchange, but the letter X change. Um, I haven't used that one either, though. Well, I don't see, I'll look and see if I can find the one that you can just print that does a similar thing, except it doesn't do the um, the electrical connections. It's just a way to physically mount different things uh, on your uh, printer. I used it for um, switching between just a pin to turn your printer into a plotter and 
the regular printer. So all the like the pen didn't need any electronics on it. So it was just a mount, um, and then all the electronics stayed connected to the uh, the hot end that I was using. Uh, I just don't know where that's at right now. I'll have to I'll have to look it up and see. I I think I could find it, but it's going to take a while. Um, so I have this thing. Um, we'll put it on. I don't know if I'll get it. Uh, tomorrow is our next class. So I don't know if I'll get it done for tomorrow, but I will get it soon and um, test it out and see how it actually works and how simple it is to actually use. Um, I was going to show one other thing for today, and that was um, I think Monday I talked a little bit about um, a YouTube video that uh, uh, was saying that um, – Oh, the, the 0.6 nozzle is the way to go, which I agree with. I think over the 0.4, I actually think that's true um, in most cases. Uh, like if you're trying to print really tiny details, yes, that's not going to work very well. But for the things that I end up printing, um, I usually want the thicker lines to get the print done faster because I'm doing it to iterate on a bracket or something you know, quickly. So I, I don't want a tiny little nozzle to try and print out just a bracket. Um, so for most cases, and pretty much all the cases that I do, I would divide them into, if I want tiny details, I'm just going to send it to one of the resin printers. If I want pretty much everything else, the 0.6 nozzle is probably the one that I want to use. Um, but in that video, uh, he also mentioned that Prusa and Cura have a new slicer engine option in them. And so um, I went and got the one from Prusa here. It's not in their um, main uh, release right now, their last stable release. It's in this alpha release. Cura, um, it probably is in Cura. I didn't go actually go look in Cura. It came from Cura. So uh, it's called the Arachne Slicer or Arachne Engine. I'm not sure what term they use for it, but it's the, um, the algorithm that actually does the slicing and deciding where the walls are going to be and where the infill is going to be and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's Cura developed it, um, at least as far as I know, the Cura developed it. But Cura is open source, and so Prusa has ported it over to their slicer, and that's the one that I I know how to actually access it. So um, you do have to have this uh, current. You know, this was just 12 days ago they posted this. So 2.5 alpha three. Um, if you this is on GitHub, yeah, you can see the address up there. Uh, GitHub, Prusa 3D, Prusa Slicer releases down at the bottom. You can find the one that matches your system, or you can find the source code and uh, compile it yourself. But um, I did that, and now, well, that's that's Cura again. Here's Prusa. This is the 2.5 Alpha Prusa, Prusa. And if you look in print settings. Let's see, it's going to be in layers and perimeters. And here it is, perimeter generator. So it's mainly talking about the, you know, the G code for the perimeters. So it's got two in here. It's got the Arachne and the Classic. So what I thought we'd do is we would slice up some things and, and see if we could notice the difference in the Arachne versus the Classic. Basically, they're taking, um, you know, two different ways of thinking about how you're going to generate the perimeter of the object. And um, the classic one is what you've been using. Arachne, I'm not, I don't know that I can explain how it uh, approaches the thing. I didn't look, I, I did see that it was based on a research paper um, that I may go track down, see if I can find where I found that research paper. I don't remember where I found the research paper. I don't see it right now. Um, but, oh wait, wait, here we go. Actually right here. So it's based on uh, the new perimeter and the new lightning infill reported from Cura. Cura, you've seen, I think I've showed the lightning infill. Basically what that does is it's a way to, um, maybe you don't need a lot of strength, but you do need a top on the part you're printing. And so you can't print it very hollow. Um, and so what lightning does is it makes these lightning bolt shaped infill patterns where the, as you get closer to the top, where you're going to need more dense infill um, in order for the top not, not to droop down or anything, um, then they get 
more dense at the top, and but they're lightning bolt patterns, and so it's a faster infill. If you don't need the infill for strength, you only need the infill to kind of support a lid on the part you're printing. Um, so that was also ported over to Prusa. They didn't have that at the, uh, until recently. Um, but it's based on this paper here, which I think is this one. And framework for adaptive width control of dense contour parallel to pass, tool pass in fused deposition modeling. Um, I don't want those. All right. Um, and so you could, I, I haven't read the paper yet. You can actually download the PDF of it uh, and uh, see what it says. Maybe I'll do that just to get a better idea of what it's actually doing. But uh, the result of what it's doing is, oh wait, I don't want that. I don't want that. Um, the result of what it's doing is that it is um, typically making um, finer details resolve better um, when using a, a larger diameter nozzle than could normally resolve those fine details. Um, and it does other things. In, in general, it resolves these finer details better. So um, we need a model to slice, which um, I don't know what, let's, let's just make one. So I'm gonna go over here. This is what I typically do when um, I need something and I, don't want to fire up SolidWorks or Fusion 360 or something like that. Just go to Tinkercad. Oh, right. that will. Let's let's make a little little thing. Just flatten it out, make it more round, and then let's put some small text on it. Okay, and let's that's you know way too big. <laughs> I keep I mean working in a really tiny window, so it's let's do something like that. All right. Now we've got our uh, little thing here. Export mm -hmm. that as a STL. This is called the Terrific Kirken. Actually, when it exported it, it gave it some weird name, like just numbers. All right, so now we're over in Cura, and I've dropped that little guy in there. Um, relative extruder. Oh, um, oh, because it's Let's use uh, Ender 3. There. All right. So we're currently on, let's see which one we're on. Let's do the classic. And let's slice it. And so this is what was left of my uh, my text. Not a whole lot. Now there are some um, thin print thin walls, force it to print thin wall type of settings, um, but let's just turn this over to Arachne and let's see if it does it. I actually don't know that it will do any better, but let's try. Oh, look, we got most all of it and it looks like it would be mostly readable. You know, the little, the little crossbar on the T is a little weird, um, but I actually think that would stand a chance of printing and actually coming out. So that's one of the things that it will do. Um, it also, you know, when walls intersect, um, it does a better job. Um, I think it actually the, um, the uh, not the paper, but the write-up on the GitHub page gave some, here we go, gave some demonstrations of uh, better, oh, well, this is not related to it, but this is a, you, you want the seam in a certain place, you can actually paint where you want the seam to be. So that's actually a other thing. This is a flow control type of advancement here where um, mm. they are uh, trying to account for the pressure in the Bowden tube that's gonna cause oozing. 
Um, and so without the pressure control, you've got all these extra lines. With it, you've got just some little bumps where the Z seam started. Um, there's that lightning infill. So see, it starts with basically nothing at the bottom and builds off the sides to create enough support at the top so that your top part of the object doesn't sag down because it doesn't have any support to rest on. Um, here's some of the arachne stuff. So you can kind of see, this is a, a detect thin wall. Um, it will print more of the thing, but it chops off the tip of this little sharp object, kind of like the little letters that we had in the uh, Tinkercad file. Um, the arachne generator actually goes in there, is able to resolve that tip on these small details. Um, so this top picture is um, kind of the classic version. The middle picture is print. No, wait, no, that's not it. Um, oh yeah, this one is the uh, detect thin walls where it does resolve the tip, but it may not actually stick to print. And so here's with the arachne. Um, there's another, you know, another intersection classic version and where the arachne creates the same um, outer shape, but the inner shape is not just like an offset of it. It actually goes in there and, and connects these walls so you don't get these gaps between your walls. Um, there's another perimeter generator where uh, the arachne doesn't try to, you know, do these little tiny zigzag movements in here that's going to probably not going to amount to anything anyway. Um, so, I don't know how Cura, I think if you're in Cura, um, the most recent version, I don't think it's an option. I think it just does arachne. I don't think you can turn it on and off. I think it's just, that is its new process. I'd ha I'm not 100% sure about that, though. But if you want to try it out, like compare it side by side, get the uh, 2.5 Alpha 3 version of Prusa, and you can go in and, you know, Try it one way, and then go to plat. Uh, go to print settings, layers and perimeters, and then try it with the classic perimeter generator, and see what the differences are. Um, let's see if we can. I don't remember where uh, thin walls are in here. Oh, there it is. Detect thin walls. Let's turn that on with the classic and just see what we get. So the classic one, I do get um, more details than I had before, but you know there's some gaps, uh, and it's not as nice as what the arachne perimeter detector did. I don't think. I think this doesn't look as nice. Now again, this is really tiny, so when you print it, there may maybe not that noticeable of a difference.